Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit that button down there. You don't miss a single thing. Oh, and thanks. Standing by. Oh, no. Here it is. Here it is. Oh, my God. Who's going first? Hey, oh, everyone. Going first. Sorry. Hey, everyone. It's Molly Wood. I was waiting for the sigh, like we do, but it didn't happen. I didn't know what to do. Anyway, hello, everyone. It's Molly Wood here. Hello. Hello, I'm Kai Rizdal. This is Make Me Smart, as you know, because you're here and you're downloading us. You're listening every week, as uh, as we hope you do. Uh, it's about all the things that interest us in tech and culture and the economy. A little podcast we do called Make Me Smart. None of us, as we all know, is as smart as all of us. That is right. All of us today includes a brilliant woman and thinker who actually has possibly had a bigger impact on how we eat or at least how we think about what we eat than nearly anybody else we can think of. Her name is Frances Moore LePay. The thing she is most known for is starting the conversation around the plant-based diet. Now, obviously, that's a huge conversation right now. Frances dropped a little book on it called Diet for a Small Planet in 1971. And at that time, the ideas amounted to a little bit of a revolution. Yeah, just a little bit. So here we are, uh, let's see, 49 years later, uh, we are still eating hundreds of pounds of meat uh, a year in this country, but uh, vegetarianism and veganism as well uh, are, you know, plant-based through and through. Uh, that is growing as a way that people choose to live, right? The vegan economy is big, it is international, and it is growing enormously. So um, I think it's safe to say that a plant-based diet now is going mainstream. Absolutely. And one of the reasons, of course, is climate change. And there, you know, it's that's just one of many conversations around it. There's health, ethics of animal treatment, uh, the desertification of soil, um, and then, of course, the impact on climate of the way that we conduct agriculture and then, of yeah. course, uh, animal use. And so there are very smart people doing things in sustainable food production. You've heard on this very show. We talked about meat replacement. Um, but right now we're going to talk about sort of how to eat writ large. Hmm. Uh, Frances Moore LePay, here's the official introduction. She's a researcher, author uh, on food and democracy policy. Um, she writes a lot. Um, <laughs> and, and she is now here with us, taking a break from her writing. Frances, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. My great pleasure. So it's been, as I said, 49 years since your breakthrough book. Um, did you think it would take this long for, for um, a plant-based diet to become a mainstream thing? Well, I was surprised from the beginning at the response I got, and I came to feel that people really, really wanted to connect their daily choices to a bigger meaning, you know, that we're having an impact every day with what we what we choose to put into our mouths, and I think that's the need it met, and so in that sense, I'm not surprised because I think this sense of, of meaning and power and connection to others, that's really, really powerful. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's interesting because your first book was about the global scarcity scare, right, in the late 60s, this idea that hunger and food shortages were in the headlines, and you argued that there was more than enough food for everybody on the planet. And I wonder how your thinking has evolved from uh, this idea of a scarcity scare to climate. Well, I'm still shocked at the prevalence of the scarcity scare. It's still the idea that there's not enough, even though there's 2,900 calories produced for every person on Earth, and still we have over 800 million people who are calorie deficient, and that number is growing. So we still have the same problem that shocked me out of my chair in the UC Berkeley Ag Library. So um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really this both-and world, like people are waking up but not going deep enough. And I think the more that we can see our food choices as a way to ask the next question and the next question, how our diet choices are linked to a food system that is actually destroying, destroying the capacity of the earth to feed us. At the same time, it's he helping to heat the planet. And so this is the time for big wake up. So let's talk about uh, some of the things that you have, you have written about and you've been an advocate for. Um, regenerative agriculture. First of all, what's that? Well, I love that term. You know, we used to call it sustainable, mm -hmm. but now we're really talking about because our soil is so degraded in so many ways and the massive overuse of chemicals that we're talking about regeneration of that that living earth that we have to understand the difference between dirt and soil, that soil is alive with um, microorganisms. They say that they're in a teaspoon, they're more than 
all of humanity in number. And these are the uh, microbes that enable plants to grow and, and transform nutrients into what plants can use. That's a healthy soil, and that's what we're destroying. So regenerative agriculture is the real serious focus on the quality of our soil and therefore the um, planting, keeping it covered mm-hmm. and keeping uh, the that, that uh, plant life going. So I think it's, um, and what's so great and what really inspires me is that we're learning that it can happen faster than we thought uh, as we stop the, the, the over-intensive, you know, um, uh, turning of the soil mm. and using of chemicals and really allow uh, plants to grow. Agroforestry, for example, is a terrific instance of this regenerative approach because you're mixing shrubs and trees with um, food crops, and it, it increases the output and restores the soil. Hmm. I did. I did and an so, interview with a farm. Sorry, I did an interview with a yeah, farmer no, once, and, and we were standing on his driveway, and I said, "Let's go stand on that dirt over there." And he said, "It's not dirt, it's soil." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's anyway, great. Sorry, yeah. Molly, go ahead. No, I. I actually, I was uh, thinking of that documentary that has been making the rounds, Biggest Little Farm, that sort of introduces these concepts, but doesn't really call them that. Um, but you know, that's a. The reason I bring it up is because that's a, a small farm. Like, where mm-hmm. do these ideas, regenerative agriculture, and then we're going to ask you to explain this to agroforestry, where do they collide with, you know, commercial agriculture at this ridiculously large scale that we've been practicing it? R- right. Here's the problem, that we are locked into a f- belief system, and I believe so strongly in the power of ideas that says, oh, the market will decide and actually what has happened then is um, this notion of a free market, which there is no such thing. Every market has rules. But ours is what? Ours is whatever brings highest return to existing wealth. So what we see is this incredible concentration of power in the food industry that is very happy to keep that degradation going because the profits are still good and just soaking everything up. So what we have to do is really question that and understand that we have to be working for true democracy and be listening to our preamble to our Constitution that said our purpose as a nation is to promote the general welfare. And to do that, we have to have a democratic polity that can create farm policy that really encourages farmers to nurture that soil and to experiment with, for example, agroforestry um, that is proven, as I say, to be so effective, and other forms of what are called agroecology, regenerative agriculture. So really, we have to go that deep. We have to go that deep to what are the rules that, you know, you know, really, when you think about it, no one would say, yes, I want to destroy the soil. I want to produce foods that make us ill, actually. You know, our diet is a leading cause of major disease in this country. No, none of us would choose that. And so we have to ask, okay, what is leading us in that direction? And I really think we have to go that deep to this false belief and somehow we can just turn over our fates to some magical market, which actually is driven to create monopoly. So that then, as I say, takes us to democracy. And what is it? Okay, so 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 there's a lot to unpack in that answer. And, and no big I'm, deal. And I'm, no and big I'm, deal. And I'm going to take the end of it first. And look, I hear you about the democracy part, and certainly, as we see if we read the news today, democracy in this country is challenged on a on a on a very systemic basis every single day. But let's back up for a minute to the market forces that act on agriculture in this economy. We've been in, uh, we've been working on on agricultural economy for. Uh, what, 400 years here? Uh, and the challenge now, if you, you know, if you go to Iowa and talk to farmers or you go to you know, the Yakima Valley in Washington and talk to apple farmers, they want to do creative, inventive things. They want to farm mm-hmm. cleanly and they want to film, feed as many people as they possibly can. The catch, of course, is that the business incentives in the agriculture economy today are skewed toward um, uh, corn that can be used as ethanol, right? It's skewed toward maximum production, with least possible investment to get the most return. 
And and the mm-hmm. challenge, of course, is overturning that system. And how do you do that when democracy, to circle back to the point, is is challenged as it is? Well, uh, we have to do it do both. I, a friend of mine once said, you know, you can love two children at once, that we can be focused on our passion, in this case, food and growing food in a healthy way for a healthy earth and on democracy reforms at the same time. And I was just with farmers uh, this last weekend in Iowa, and many of them are very excited about the Green New Deal for farming. And uh, Ranchers and Farmers Coalition that they say represents 10,000 farmers and are very interested in changing the incentives so that they would be rewarded for actually caring for our earth the way that really almost all of us would cheer for. And that means that we have to take democracy reform seriously to get the role of um, big private money out of our system and also protect the right to vote so that we can really resist the effort to suppress vote quite frankly. So I think it's all tied. Uh, We can't separate out these two elements. Well, and I guess we could say that markets, the idea of what the market is, is not necessarily fixed, right? We are seeing a movement, even if it might not be as big as we think or as mainstream as we think, we are seeing a movement toward plant-based eating, toward a different style of interacting Uh, with food and different choices, right? Like, does that drive the market in a way that could have an impact on, you know, the capitalist forces and even the democratic decisions? Yeah, I I mean, I I think that every choice we make that aligns our daily ripples out through, you know, through through our dollar spent, every choice we make that aligns with the world that we want is important because it motivates us more and other people also see see i mean somebody's always watching right and it, those choices are sending signals out to the wider market so i think those individual choices are absolutely absolutely critical and i think that we've got to uh, embrace our democratic citizenship selves too and recognize that is not just a dull duty but an enlivening action and that's why I'm so excited that there is a democracy movement growing of people in the environmental movement, food movement, labor movement coming together and saying together we can institute democracy reform so that we have a government accountable to the citizens and one particular organization is called Democracy Initiative which now is representing um, about um, well over 40 million people through dozens of organizations and that that both and you know we can we can focus on the particular concerns and this deeper question of our democracy and I want to return again to that <laughs> that preamble to our Constitution, which said our purpose is, one of them is to promote the general welfare. And that is has to include the capacity of all of us to eat well. And now, you know, they're just enormous um, food insecurity in our own, in our own, you know, population. So all of that is our, is our responsibility. How much of this, and, you know, acknowledging that you've been working on this uh, for 50-ish years or more, frankly. Um, how much of this is a general is- generational issue? Uh, you know, I, I, and, and the root of the question is, look, it's going to be really tricky to convince Americans of a certain age to give up their hot dogs and hamburgers and, and non-plant-based foods. But I know a number of younger people in this economy, teenagers and young adults, who are, are vegan or vegetarian uh, in part because of climate change. Do we just have to wait until they're old enough to have some you know, mass market effect? Yeah, and we can certainly lower the voting age too. <laughs> that's a whole other I think that uh, <laughs> different podcast, the, but the, yes. <laughs> the beauty, the beauty of what we're saying is that everybody eats, right? And this is truly an intergenerational movement. And I've noticed just right near my office, five, you know, five years ago, I didn't see any of this, and now I'm seeing four places right there in Harvard Square where you can get really wonderful plant-based food, and all these students are really literally eating it up. So I, I think that the draw is there and um, and how it will 
food helps us make connections, right? That's one of the beauties of it. Everybody eats. Everybody likes to talk about food. And we can make the connection with the climate crisis, with the democracy crisis, and uh, we can be healthier and feel more energy ourselves at the same time. So this is why I, I just am so happy that it was food that woke me up as a young woman. I said, hey, wait a minute. We are actually creating the scarcity that we say we fear. It is a human product, and therefore we can change it. And I think that's what food can teach us, that on every level, you know, we're on the wrong, tra on the wrong track, whether it be uh, with the climate impact or the impact on the soil or the farmers now going bankrupt and the effect of diet uh, on diseases in here in the country, all of that's connected. And um, so I think it's one of those beautiful win-win-wins across generations. All right. As is very unusual on our show, I think we should end on that uh, <laughs> light note instead of that's dark true. note. Francis Moore LePay <laughs> is the author of many books, including Diet for a Small Planet, which came out in 1971. And yet I think we should all just go ahead and read right now. Francis, thank you so much for the time. Thanks so much, Francis. You're wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I, th I think it's a generational thing. I'll be honest with you. I think it's going to be, I think we have to, the young people will save us. That's me. That's what I'm saying. I, the, young, the children are definitely our future, yeah. and it is a pretty fascinating. Well, also, though, the swole people. Did I talk about this already? No, There's like this documentary. Story. Oh my gosh. There's this documentary now that is causing a whole generation of like, dude, not generation, but a whole subset of dudes who want to look really ripped because like Arnold Schwarzenegger and a bunch of athletes did this documentary yeah. on how apparent like a plant-based diet is the best way to build muscle. And so oh now God, you have really? this sub theme. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to do the real time look up while we talk, but right. you have this sub theme of like, I met a, God, where was I? What town was I in? I was in some, I was in a town for, I was in Chicago and I met a guy in Chicago who was like, yeah, I just went vegan because I want to get really buff. And there's this. Wow. That's so counterintuitive. <laughs> this documentary that's, about that's really fascinating. That's totally counterintuitive, yeah. right? Although it those, really is. Those, those plant-based people out there who listen to this will tell me, no, it's not Caillou Moran because X, Y, and Z, but for the uninitiated among it's us. Called the, it's called the Game Changers. All right. And it talks about the plant-based diet from the perspective of athletes competing in elite sports. So even so, yes, that there's there's like this upcoming generation of which there are many. Because right. even if a bunch of millennials go right. vegan, there's tons of millennials. Uh, and then if you you know you get some of like the guys who want to look really ripped in there, you get a. I actually recently signed up for. Um, this is not an ad. I promise. Okay. I'm just gonna say a meal service, but any like Sun Basket, the meal service, yeah. and plenty of other ones have vegan meals in them. And I was like, I don't know how to cook vegan, but if I just have a couple of them via meal delivery service, then we can have like a couple vegan meals a I, week. Uh, and I, I tried to convince the fam to give the, the Burger King Impossible Burger a shot. No, oh, no, yeah. How'd no, it go? Not a lot of love. No, they didn't, Wait, they, didn't, didn't they even want to try it. They wouldn't try it? They didn't even want to try it. Really? Yeah. Don't you have the rule in your house? <laughs> Which is like, you don't have to eat it, but you do have to try it. <laughs> Who's in charge at there your house, There are more guy? of them than there are of parents. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> true, oh, my God. True. Oh, my God. All right. Well, anyway, now that you know about my feelings <laughs> that, as a parent. On that, on that parent <laughs> shaming note, it seems like a good time. <laughs> send, send us your thoughts. Let us know what you think about um, what you eat, actually. That's what we're talking about because it's it's actually serious and, and what it means for, honestly, um, the planet and, and how we do what we do. Tell us about it. Send your emails and voice memos. Make me smart at marketplace.org. We are coming back in a minute. <laughs> Unless Kai storms out. Unless I throw my <laughs> headphones down in a huff. I'm I will Adam. not be talked to you that way. Exactly. Adam <sighs> Driver, did you play my voice back to me? Yeah, right. Oh, hello. We're back. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Hello. Uh, Have I told you before what a big fan I am of Drunk History? I love the show yes, called Drunk History. Yes. And I love the fact that the drunker like everybody who's drunk apparently does the same thing which is try to appear sober by saying hello we should we should we should do this podcast drunk one day and they always say it just like that hello and watch the we came close we with the gdpr this, episode we should do this podcast drunk one day and watch the matrix at the same time all right oh anyway, sorry my sorry God. sorry let's i'm just totally i'm just crossing that. streams there i'm just crossing the stream can we just have like a drunk i feel like let's call our event planning team because drunken <laughs> matrix viewing. Event planning team? we have an event planning team 
just made the top of the list. Okay. All right. We got like one lady who's awesome at stuff. All right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We'll call her up. (sighs) Moving on. Drunken Matrix viewing. Who's in? Me, but. Uh, Moving on. Okay. We're going to bring the mood down a tiny bit now. All right. You want to go first? I know. I Um, I have two things, but it looks like one of our things is similar. So maybe we can start with the one thing and then we'll just share the other thing. Okay. Um, okay. No, way to sneak uh, in one and first, a half things for you and a half a I mean, thing for me. I'm just saying. I don't like I'm rules. Just I just don't like <laughs> half a thing for you. Oh, now I feel bad. Oh, that's all right. Quick, go find another story real quick. Uh, I'm just going to present this mostly without comment, which is that as we were coming into this recording, oh, yeah. right before, I saw the breaking news that on a five to four vote, the Supreme Court... Uh, voted to allow the Trump administration to start enforcing new immigrant wealth tests, which are designed to screen out green card applicants who may be risks of becoming, quote, public charges. So now, in order to immigrate to the United States legally, you may be subject to a test of how much money you have and how much you're going to contribute to society, which... I could see sounding logical in some ways, except that a lot of the people who need to escape their countries don't have any money. Yeah, we, we should it's also be change. clear, this, this law has been on the books, right, as a visa regulation for a very long time, but it's being enforced now for the very it first It's now time. being enforced. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And yeah. I, we should also be clear that one of the arguments uh, in terms of overturning this challenge to that law was very legally right it was sort of like well national injunctions are uh, are problematic legally and it should be up to states to decide but it is a story you're going to see a lot more of yep for sure throughout the rest of the day for sure also another story you're gonna see a lot of coronavirus Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's spreading and my little tidbit my half a tidbit is that the markets are tanking today uh, because of fears of the coronavirus. And, and I will say yeah. that I, I posited on Marketplace this past Friday that, that, that maybe the coronavirus at the, what, 11 and a half, 12 year mark of an economic expansion is the exogenous threat that perhaps uh, tips things over. Uh, I will tell you that right. was not universally agreed to by the panelists on Marketplace on Friday afternoon, um, but I think it's worth keeping an eye on. And as we sit here, I'm going to dial these up here. I'm going to figure out what the numbers are. Uh, but I'm as we see now, here, yeah, mar- markets down a bunch, yeah. right? So, you know. A bunch. The Dow's down 2.74% at this exact moment. Mm, no, it's right? not. No? 2.74%. That's, what, oh, that's on the like scroll. 1,000 points, yeah. So it's down a percent, you know, 1.1%. NASDAQ's off percent and a half. It's been worse today. I'm just saying. Oh, yeah, sorry. 1.1%, one one, yes. Yeah. Have yeah. a look and don't listen to my <laughs> things that I see on the scroll. Yeah. Numbers. <laughs> I'm not I'm not as good as Kai, so I don't have the ability to have that internal gut check, like the internal skepticism. I'm like, nope, that number's too high. Yeah. 330 points. Yeah. Which, you know, it's not nothing. I mean, it's a good day to go shopping yeah. at the stock store. Yeah, it, it We're is. We're going to look at it on the positive. That's right. Um, I, disco- I listen to this podcast, and I have to give it credit because it's the only place I've heard it, the Pro Rata podcast from Axios, where I learned today that and by the way, this is a very hard story to Google, to DuckDuckGo, because John Bolton is in the news today for lots mm-hmm. of other reasons. But it turns out that back in 2018, when John Bolton became National Security Advisor, uh, he essentially disbanded this global health security team that was headed by Rear Admiral Timothy Zemer. He left the National Security Council, uh, and he was in charge of pandemic effort, like basically pandemic prevention coordination. His whole job Mm -hmm. was his whole job, along with this global health security team that no longer exists, was to coordinate the nation's response to global pandemics, whether it's, you know, making sure that the TSA is working with the NIH is also working with CDC so that like if we're screening passengers here, then also we're transmitting those test results to the NIH and, you know, basically making sure that it's all working to prevent outbreaks. And currently we do not have that, which I felt was worth noting. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. it's absolutely worth noting. And I and I second that notice, for yeah. sure. We should probably get that. Yep. Okay. All right, there we go. <laughs> That's that. Still need a hug. <laughs> That's it for the News Fix podcast edition. <sighs> However, you can get much more of the News Fix in newsletter edition, more news and recommendations and other stuff. 
uh, that will definitely make you smart. The newsletter is just fantastic. Go to marketplace.org slash newsletters to sign up. There we go. Mailbag time. Go. Nice. I say Hi, it. Hi, Molly. This is God, Brent in Detroit. This is Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. So last week we talked about the Equal Rights Amendment. And I, for one, will say that I learned a ton on that podcast. Same. I truly did. So great. Um, it was really awesome. Eric Holmberg from Minneapolis uh, listened and he wrote to say this, quote, I love the episode on the ERA. It was super informative. You brought up there being different versions of the amendment, but a simple breakdown of the three main types is important to consider. One, it is prohibited to discriminate against women. It is prohibited to discriminate. <laughs> It is prohibited to discriminate against people on the basis of sex. It is prohibited to discriminate against people on the basis of sex or gender identity. These are obviously very simple summations, there it goes on, of the different drafts, but the differences are important to point out. Only the third one protects against discrimination for people who identify their gender as anything outside of the male-female distinction. It's important to protect all people against discrimination of any kind, and because of this, the first two versions of the ERA are not sufficient, in my opinion. So... There you go. Huh. Yes. There you go. Interesting. Yes. We should note, yep. apparently, right, that yep. the actual wording of the draft of the ERA that most states ratified in the 70s goes like this. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. In fact, the title of that Ruth Bader Ginsburg movie was on the basis on of sex. Of, yeah. On account of sex. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. Boy, that was a great one. That documentary. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the culture. documentary, right? RBG, which was amazing. You're talking about the other Oh, one. yeah. But there yeah. was also the fictionalized right, one, which right, I think was right. weirdly called On the Basis of yes. Sex, which does sound cooler than On Account of Sex. But anyway, yes. it doesn't say anything about gender identity specifically. And so I guess the, the next question is whether On the Basis of Sex mm -hmm. covers it. And that's why we have a lawyer. I don't know. Now I just want to get last week's guest back because <laughs> I, want to ask, yeah. well, I basically want to ask her everything mm -hmm. that I ever want to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. More on the coronavirus. Because, man, Coming to you. last week it was my news fix and I was obviously like a little freaked out. Uh, and now everybody else is freaked out. And now maybe we're probably overreacting. I don't really know. But listener Ariana Gabzi sent in a comment about all the stories that are being written about it now. And she, she needs our help. Hi, Molly and Guy. This is Ariana calling from Minneapolis. When Molly shared her fears about a global pandemic with the rise of the coronavirus in China, I was reminded of a book I finished called Lost City of the Monkey God by the journalist Douglas Preston. Mr. Preston talks a bit about the history of global pandemics, uh, namely uh, when Europeans first traveled to the Americas, but also about uh, the current likelihood of a global pandemic and how globalization and climate change are actually having an outsized impact in increasing the risk and likelihood of such a global pandemic. So uh, it might be worth making us all smarter about what a global pandemic might actually mean for us without going to the dark place immediately. Uh, and also reflecting back a little bit on the history of when it's happened before. Thank you, as always, for making me smarter. Global pandemic, but let's play the happy music. I, we don't, I don't want to go know. to the dark place, though. I don't know. I just, I like how she's like, can you just stick to the facts? Yeah. No freak out. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then Sam, God love him, our producer put in a bunch of facts. I know, right? Fun-filled facts about global pandemics. I mean, I'm just saying that when you start to factor in the climate change and the like viruses that have been mm -hmm. locked up in ice in the Arctic that might be released due to the melting, you can get to the dark place really fast. So I'm going to stop. Yes. The Spanish flu in 1918 was the worst pandemic in history, killing 100 million people, which was roughly 4% of the Earth's population at the time. So, is so that, what's, very, is that so not, what's, not dark place? So, so what's 4% of 7 billion? So 10% of, sorry, so 10% yeah. of 7 billion is uh, 700, million. 700 million. So half of that plus or minus 350 million people. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot of souls. Whether globalization is increasing the risk, for sure. Today, people are more international and mobile. They're more likely to live in cities than in the past. All those factors increase the risk of a virus spreading, not to mention airplanes. Yep. Also slightly dark place. And then another listener, Robert Hammond, wrote in to tell us that this viral family that the coronavirus is a part of, and which also includes SARS, by the way, this is sort mm -hmm. of a mutation of the SARS virus, uh, puts out a new virus about every 10 years. 
and the new one is almost always more deadly than the previous. So we can expect a new virus on the horizon another 10 years from now. Ten years. I feel like we did not go to the dark place. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, we did. Okay. But, ten years however, before. like, I do think that this is a really good thing to get smart about because it's like a thing that we tend to forget is yeah. out there. And I, I actually think that some of the things that are happening, like, it's just really interesting to see, like, China apparently was really, uh, does not want to repeat the way that mm -hmm. SARS mm -hmm. went because they were really accused of sort of covering up the number of infections and, you know, helping it spread. And they don't want that to happen. It they took a big economic hit. So they're being more transparent than usual. And they gave, like, the CDC the entire sequence of the virus, which is really interesting. Hmm. Um yeah, there, I mean, there's just a bunch of kind of like fascinating, I don't know, maybe we can do a coronavirus episode next year, next week, but hmm. it is it is really interesting. Hmm. Slash terrifying. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, that's that's right. That's right. That's right. So we're going to end uh, as we do with the Make Me Smart question. What is something you thought you knew but found out you were wrong about? Today's answer, like last week's answer, and today's conversation, by the by, is related to food or drink, which is, you know, close enough. Answering the question is a guy named Benjamin Walker. He hosts a podcast called Benjamin Walker's Theory of Everything, and here's what he sent us. So I used to be totally opposed to the idea of fancy coffee culture. In fact, every time I'd see one of these new fancy mahoganized coffee shops popping up in my neighborhood, I'd scowl because I always thought that coffee was supposed to be something cheap. You know, it doesn't cost a lot of money. Uh, you can always brew more, throw it out if it gets cold. Well, thanks to some recent work I did, including even going to Kenya, I realized that my aversion to thinking about coffee as something with value comes from the fact that it is a product with a colonial history and it was pretty much a slave product. And therefore, when I would pour it out, when I would not give it any value, when I would think it was supposed to be cheap, I was never really understanding you know, the history of that. Uh, and now I've come to realize that by giving this product the value it deserves, I only love it more. And it doesn't mean I have to go into the fancy coffee shop, but I can tell you I have a uh, thermos, a metal one, and I, 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 I keep the coffee I make warm so I don't have to pour it out if I forget about it because I'm reading a book or looking at something on the internet. And uh, that, that is how I came to truly value coffee. Hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's such a make me smart answer yeah, to the make that, me smart question. That's a good one. I yeah. love that. I'm good with that. That's good. Yeah, me too. Hmm. I got nothing to add except go. sip. Nice. So that's what we got. More from us on our smart speaker thing that we do. We make us smarter about something new every single day. Just tell your Echo device to say, or you don't say it. You say it. The device doesn't say it. Just tell your Echo device to make me smart, and it will um, pipe right up with me or Molly, depending on what the day is. Speaking of which, I have to record mm -hmm. a bunch of those. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah. Except not now. No. Not Except now. maybe now. Maybe we should switch. Well, we can, <laughs> we can just not do the logistics of schedule yes. during the show. Make Me Smart is produced and directed by Sam Anderson. Our digital producer is Tony Wagner. Our senior producer is Jody Becker. Thanks to our video producer, Ben Hethcote, and our video intern, Ethan Parrots. And I love that the pronouncer for Ethan is always like, parrots, like the bird. So in my mind, Ethan just goes around with like a parrot on his shoulder, like one of those guys in Hawaii. Anyway, thanks to writer-producer Erica Phillips. This week's program <laughs> was engineered. First time down the shoot for Jay Seabold. Nice job, Jay. You didn't screw anything up. Good work, Jay. Excellent. Theme music was composed by Ben Talladay and Daniel Ramirez. The executive director of On Demand is Tatar Nieves. The senior vice president and general manager is Deborah Clark. Is checks notes Deborah Clark. <laughs> 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 that would be funny.